Welcome everyone to the second segment of the six part heart and vascular webinar series. The webinar is an enterprise wide event involving Cleveland Clinic main campus, Cleveland Clinic London, Cleveland Clinic Canada, Cleveland Clinic Las Vegas, and Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. Last week's segment was on revascularization and coronary artery disease, and today we will shift gears to preventive cardiology with a wide range of topics from lifestyle to coronary calcium scoring that are sure to generate an interesting discussion. The session will consist of eight crafted talks with a discussion section to follow after every two talks. We have a wonderful set of speakers today from Cleveland Clinic main campus, Las Vegas, Canada, and CCAD. And so without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Nicole Sorodin is the Chair of Preventive Medicine in the Medical Subspecialties Institute and leads the Executive Health Program at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. She's among the first medical professionals globally to be certified as a diplomat of the ABLM, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Prior to joining Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, she was the Assistant Professor of Medicine at Whale Cornell Medical College. And as part of her practice, she focuses on the use of evidence-based lifestyle therapeutics such as predominantly whole food, plant-based diet, physical activity, sleep hygiene, stress management, tobacco cessation, and other non-drug modalities to prevent, treat, and reverse chronic diseases. In the short time of me being at CCAD, we've enjoyed many discussions on the impact and power of, prevent, of prevention, especially in regards to coronary artery disease. Thus, what better person than Dr. Sorodin to start off this segment tackling a very heated topic in regards to what we eat, or I should say what we don't eat and its impact on heart disease. Hello everyone, my name is Nicole Sorotin. I'm an internal medicine physician and the department chair for preventive medicine at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. I'll be speaking to you today about intermittent fasting. I have one con conflict of interest disclosure. I participate in fasting once a week, no other disclosures. So in the spring of 2012, my husband read an article in Harper's uh, Magazine, Starving Your Way to Vigor. This highlighted the history of fasting in addition to a personal story of someone in 1880 who fasted for 41 days. As a cook and a curious human, with some time on his hands. He decided that this sounded like an interesting experiment and he set out to see how long he could go without eating. He lasted 21 days with no ill effects except for some food obsession. So as the rim's responsible medical professional of the family, I decided I needed to, uh, to, to look into this. And this began my personal professional journey into fasting. I'm gonna talk about intermittent fasting today. So this is defined with time-restricted feeding, specific times of the day that are fasting, alternate day fasting, five to five days a week of eating and two days a week of fasting. And then there's the fasting mimicking diet. So many studies document calorie restriction, have an improvement in health span and lifespan in a variety of organisms, including humans. Daily calorie restriction has been shown to reduce diabetes, insulin-like growth factor, and many metabolic factors. The, one of the leading researchers in fasting, DeCabo from Hopkins, has this quote, you take any animal that's older, you put them on calorie restriction, one of the first things that you observe is that any cell that is damaged tends to be turned over. There was a large randomized trial of over 200 non-obese adults, and they were randomized to 25% calorie restriction versus eating normally. The intervention group showed an improvement in blood pressure, lipids, insulin resistance. The drawback was compliance, so only 12%. They only achieved 12% calorie reduction rather than the 25%. So it's hard for people to have calorie restriction for long term, but people do like to fast. So millenn over the millennia, people have fasted for religious and non-religious reasons. The thought behind fasting and its health benefits are rooted in metabolic switch, ketone production and autophagy. Just as a reminder, after about 10 to 14 hours of fasting, the depletion of liver glycogen stores and hydrolysis of triglycerides into free fatty acids and adipocytes is happening. At that same time, you have ketosis. This is what's informing the, the fasting window for many of these intermittent fasting studies. After about um, 
uh, after these free fatty acids get released into the circulation, they're transported to the uh, hepatocytes, which converts them into the keto, the ketones, keto, the acid, acetoacetate and the beta-hydroxybutyrate. Beta after about 24 hours of fasting, we have built up between two and five millimoles of ketones in our body, which is thought to be uh, beneficial for many organs. There are studies showing increased brain plasticity, neurogenesis, improved insulin sensitivity in both muscle and liver, reduced inflammation in the gut, and of course, the most important organ for this audience, the heart. So increased parasympathetic tone, reduced resting heart rate, increased heart rate variability, reduced blood pressure, and increased stress resistance. We don't think this is just due to weight loss. So there's some pilot studies that have informed um, this concept where 57% decrease in fasting insulin levels were found. In two randomized trials with over 100 women each where they were randomized to either the 5-2, which again is five days of normal eating, two days of fasting, versus a 25% reduction in normal calories. They both lost weight on the same amount after six months but that the 5-2 group had improved insulin sensitivity and reduction in waist circumference. Intermittent fasting has been found to have an improved uh, cardiovascular risk factors in humans, reduction in blood pressure, resting heart rate, cholesterol, lipids, uh, uh, glucose, insulin, inflammation, oxidative stress. Interestingly as well, improved efficacy of endurance training and abdominal fat loss. The heart rate variability is thought to be due to the enhanced parasympathetic tone, both seen in rats and in humans. It starts after about two to four weeks of fasting and decreases after a few weeks of quote, a normal diet. As we know, heart rate variability has been associated with increased mortality and a greater risk of cardiac events. There's also been studies looking at LDL particle size, which have shown an improvement and in an increased LDL particle size after 10 weeks of alternate day fasting in humans. Intermittent fasting has been studied in many areas that I won't go through the details of, but cancer, reduced toxicity and improved efficacy in chemotherapy, multiple sclerosis with reduction symptoms as short as two months into an intermittent fasting regimen, surgery. And a lot of this is thought to be due to this concept of the neuronal stress resistance and defense in DNA uh, repair. I'm gonna go through two randomized trials. The first one looked at alternate day fasting compared with calorie restriction and uh, both compared to a control. It was a 12 month study where six months was a weight loss and six months was weight, weight maintenance with of course weight loss as the main outcome. Secondary outcomes included risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So the first study, the first results you can see the compliance was poor in the alternate day fasting. It's hard to do this. <laughs> So on the days that they were supposed to fast, you could see the orange dots show the actual energy intake was higher than the blue dots of the prescribed energy intake. And then on the feast days, they also ate less than they were prescribed. But the outcomes overall were positive for weight loss for both intervention groups. After 12 months, they were able to maintain about a 6% weight change. There was also an increase in HDL in the alternate day fasting group as compared to the calorie restriction group. There was, in addition, an increase in LDL. So alternate day fasting did not produce superior results to the calorie restriction in terms of weight loss um, or improvement of indicators for cardiovascular disease. Both the intervention groups lost weight in comparison to the control and they also did not show improvements to insulin sensitivity, lipids, or blood pressure as compared to the control. The alternate day fasting group had higher LDL compared to the control at 12 months. The caveat with this is that almost all these participants had normal blood pressure, cholesterol, and glucose at baseline. There was a high dropout rate in the alternate day fasting group, which shows us that this is a less sustainable option. The second randomized trial received a lot of press and a lot of messages from my patients asking me if, if time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting was worth it. So 100 participants, 50 of these were in person, and they were randomized to time-restricted eating between 12 and 8 p.m. or consistent meal timing. Eat three meals a day at these times. The primary outcome was weight loss, and the secondary outcomes were the metabolic factors. 
So you can see the problem from, from the beginning in the weight change. The top bar is the, uh, is the, is the control group, which you're just told to eat consistent meal times, and the bottom is the uh, is the intervention group. So there was clearly a lot of weight loss in certain people in the in the um, control group, which of course skewed the the outcomes here. Weight change, you can see both groups lost weight, and there was a wide splay of weight change in both groups. There was a slight improvement in systolic blood pressure. And there was a slight decrease in the control group, and there was a slight decrease in diastolic blood pressure in the intervention group. There were no significant differences in, in insulin, glucose, and other metabolic factors. There was one very significant finding, which was a lean mass reduction in the time restricted eating group. So, normally in a weight loss study, you can account for 20 to 30% of your weight loss as lean mass. And in this group, it was up to 65%. So the results of this study, there was no significant difference in weight loss. Both groups lost minimal weight. Although this trial was too short for significant weight loss, it was really, it was only 12 weeks long. The control group clearly uh, was influenced by being a part of the study uh, for weight loss. Um, the time-restricted eating group uh, lost more lean mass, and this was a significant finding, although they had significantly less uh, physical activity over time. So in conclusions, there were no significant difference in fat mass, fasting insulin, glucose. Um, but again, these people had normal metabolic profiles at the beginning of the study. So this contradicted previous reports describing the beneficial effects of time-restricted eating on metabolic risk mar mar markers. And prior studies showed the benefit in metabolically abnormal people. I will say the author of this study confessed that he, uh, he himself used to do time-restricted eating. And after the study stopped and he started eating breakfast again. <laughs> so really the question is, is the timing of the eating critical? So there is one study that looks at early time restricted feeding and pre-diabetics where they eat from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. that showed very significant increases in insulin sensitivity and beta cell function. So in conclusion, intermittent fasting has been shown to be an effective tool for weight loss and reduction of cardiovascular risk factors in people with metabolic derangement. It's not necessarily better than calorie restriction, but it's a good tool for some people who calorie restriction might not work for. There's no improvements in cardiometabolic health seen in healthy participants. There is a concern for muscle loss if intermittent fasting is done with a reduction in physical activity. And having an early eating period may be more effective for improvement of metabolic markers. But of course, more studies are needed. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Dr. Sayed Najee, and he will be discussing does what we eat actually matter when it comes to coronary artery disease? Dr. Uh, Najib is a cardiologist at Cleveland Clinic Canada and the medical director for the cardiology lab services. He diagnoses and treats many conditions, including coronary artery disease, valvular disease, structural heart disease, and conduction heart disease and dyslipidemia. He was born in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates and studied uh, his Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery at the Gulf Medical University in Najman, Dubai. He re relocated to Cleveland, Ohio to complete his residency in internal medicine at Cleveland Clinic's Fairview Hospital before moving to Kingston, Ontario to complete his residency in cardiology at Queen's University. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada Cardiology and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada Internal Medicine and also a fellow of the American College of Cardiology. He is particularly interested in primary prevention and coronary artery disease. And Dr. Najib has contributed research for medical journals, including echocardiography. In his practice, Dr. Najib believes prevention is always better than cure and that moderation is positively and, and positivity are key factors for a healthy lifestyle. And he's not treating patients. Of course, he enjoys traveling, watching movies and dining out. And so we'd like to welcome Dr. Najib for this next talk. Hey everyone, uh, thank you for inviting me to this webinar. My name is Sayed Samir Najib. I'm a cardiologist uh, in uh, Cleveland Clinic, Canada. And uh, my topic today is, uh, does what we eat matter 
when it comes to CAD, uh, focusing mostly on the Mediterranean diet. Now, the learning objective here is to uh, demonstrate that the Mediterranean diet does have a strong association with reducing cardiovascular uh, disease risk factor outcomes. And lifestyle modification also has an important cardioprotective benefit. I have no disclosures. Um, my practice here, uh, my average age group is, uh, population is between 45 and 65. So middle-aged uh, patients uh, equal male to female distribution, They're mostly low to moderate risk. And um, they have a wide spectrum of diets they follow uh, based on personal preferences and their risk factors. And they're very well informed patients uh, about various types of diet. Um, now the Mediterranean diet, uh, essentially the, the pyramid uh, is based on uh, a lot on the uh, lifestyle uh, choices the, uh, uh, the people in the Mediterranean area make, which includes being physically active, social interaction. And I, I must say the timing of the meals is an essential part of their um, uh, of, uh, part of their lifestyle. Uh, they usually eat mostly in the afternoons and avoid eating late uh, towards the evening. Um, as we go up the pyramid, it's based on fruits and vegetables, whole foods. Uh, olive oil is an essential part of the uh, diet. Then moderate amounts of fish consumption, uh, fair amounts of dairy and uh, chicken. Um, but the, the, the top of the pyramid is really less red meat and sweets. Um, now, uh, this table summarizes uh, the, uh, the makeup of the Mediterranean diet. Um, now, uh, I must stress the extra virgin olive oil is a, is a very essential part of their primary fat source, and so is the fish. Uh, they also consume a lot of nuts. Uh, most of their food is well-sourced and whole food-based, uh, and they really do limit processed uh, and refined foods. Um, now, ReadyMed study was the, the uh, largest randomized trial which uh, was published initially in 2013. Uh, which looked at uh, patients who had uh, high-risk cardiovascular uh, disease risk factors, um, and they were divided essentially in three groups. Uh, the first one being the Mediterranean diet with uh, nuts, the second Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil, and their control group was uh, the low-fat arm. Um, the outcomes were driven by uh, overall reduction in uh, of 29% in cardiovascular disease uh, outcomes. And it was essentially driven by stroke reduction of around 42%. Um, now, uh, an important thing to, to point out is in 2018, uh, this, uh, this publication was retracted because of randomization issues. 12% of the um, study population was, was taken out of the original study. The data was reanalyzed. NEGM republished that in 2018, and they did say that uh, there was no significant difference in the outcomes. Uh, uh, there was a huge outpour of uh, whether this, uh, this trial is valid or not, and there's a lot of debates around this. Um, now, in terms of all the randomized trials that have been published uh, over the years for Mediterranean diet and uh, CVD related endpoints, the initial one, initial one being lion, the Lion Heart Study, which uh, had a small patient population, but these were mostly survivors of MI. And um, there was 73% reduction in reinfarction rates uh, in that study. And then as we go down in the ReadyMed study, uh, have, it has been cited over several publications, but post-hoc analysis showed 38% reduction in atrial fibrillation in, in the arm, which was on the extra virgin olive oil group. Uh, there was also uh, data showing that there was weight loss, control of diabetes, uh, and breast cancer, and peripheral artery disease. Now, um, interestingly, uh, if we go and look at, in detail about biomarkers and whether what impact the Mediterranean diet actually has uh, on a patient's uh, risk factor profile, uh, this JAMA article was an interesting publication in 2018. It looked at it looked, it looked at around 26,000 uh, women from the Women, women Health Study group. Uh, it was uh, a prospective analysis, and essentially showed that there was significant reduction in inflammation, uh, the insulin resistance, um, and and the body mass index, along with hypertension, ranging between 20 to 30 percent. 
Um, they also analyzed other biomarkers, but but these top three were the significant reduction where, where uh, really it made an impact. Um, going to different types of diets now, there, there's a wide spectrum of different diets uh, ranging from you know various vegan, vegetarian uh, combinations, and then you know essentially different types of diets which are out there. And uh, um, I'm just gonna uh, um, touch quickly on this uh, Adventist health study, uh, um, which essentially looked at vegetarians and different type of vegetarian diet combinations in all cause mortality. And it did, it, it did show that the you know patients who were consuming a lot of vegetables did have lower mortality. And then a subgroup analysis of the different types of vegetarian combinations showed the PESCO vegetarians had the best mortality outcomes. Uh, the PESCO group essentially consuming seafood with vegetables. Um, this is an interesting publication from uh, Dr. O'Keefe and his group. Uh, and he introduced this PESCO Mediterranean diet with intermittent fasting. Uh, this was published last year. And I think it's an interesting uh, observation and, and a suggestion, I guess, from their group, which uh, they really stress on the timing of eating and having a narrow window of eating between 9 a.m. to 6 p.m and using intermittent fasting to guide their diet pyramid. Uh, the PESCO Mediterranean diet is essentially driven by water as their preferred beverage. They do consume a lot of fruits and vegetables, olive oil, but it's mostly the meat sources, seafood and, and red meat and other dietary sources of meat is minimal. Um, now, uh, you know, whether it's the PESCO diet or Mediterranean diet, I think it's important to, uh, to mention olive oil and fish are really the probably the driving factors of the benefits which we see from Mediterranean diet and uh, and the other forms of uh, dietary combinations. You know, the olive oil uh, essentially the benefits are uh, from the phenols. Uh, it has high antioxidant properties. It does increase HDL, reduces LDL, and lowers type two diabetes risk. Um, and it's, cons it's consumed in generous amounts, up to a gallon a month, uh, by the people in the Mediterranean area. In terms of fish, access to good quality fish uh, obviously results in high omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, it has been shown to reduce risk of heart failure, metabolic syndrome, and CVD risk factors. Um, in, in conclusion, I think this is a, uh, this is a big topic. Uh, diet is a complex uh, um, um, issue to discuss with patients. However, I would say that diet and lifestyle together uh, uh, go hand in hand. We do need better prospective trials to compare the different types of diets. And I would say that intermittent fasting is an interesting area to explore with, with a diet. Um, and uh, essentially, in the end, lifestyle and diet go hand in hand together. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Said and Dr. Nicole. We have a few questions. Uh, Nicole, the first question is, does it matter when you break your fast, so long as you do the 16 hours? Uh, thank you for that question. And thanks to the organizers for this meeting. I'm, I'm very uh, happy with all of the speakers that are, are attending. Um, so that's a really good question, and I think it gets at the timing uh, as far as when you break your fast. So the data so far looks like if you are doing a timed eating, meaning the same time every day, you're going to have an eating period that potentially eating in the morning from eight to two or eight to three is a better window metabolically than eating later in the evening. So I think the timing does matter, and a lot of this is based on circadian rhythm and when our body's producing glucose. Um, so at this point, that's the, uh, the, the best information we have. Now, I will say with the 5-2 diet, that study that came out where the women who have done the 5-2, meaning five days a week, they eat normally, and two days a week, they eat less than 500 calories. Those were not timed. So they were fasting, but it was this modified fast where they actually were consuming calories, just um, less than 500 calories a day. And in those studies, it didn't matter the time of day they were eating. They were just eating very little in the two days. And those women had uh, improved uh, insulin sensitivity and, and abdominal fat reduction over just calorie restriction alone. 
Dr. Sayed, thank you very much for your talk as well. How, how have you found uh, patients uh, in, in, in North America uh, sticking to the Mediterranean diet? How have you been able to convince your patients and have they been able to be compliant to this sort of Mediterranean diet? Thank you so much for this, uh, this question. And uh, um, so in terms of the uh, patient population I have here, um, there's a wide spectrum of patients I see. Uh, I find the Mediterranean diet is more suitable and usually followed by patients who, uh, who have a connection with the Mediterranean uh, from a cultural perspective. The, the, in Canada, we have a lot of uh, patients who, you know, who moved from Europe back in many years ago. So I think their lifestyle, especially the ones I, I see here, mostly are Italian uh, and Greek uh, background. And they do have, uh, that's, their, that's part of their lifestyle. And I think those are the ones who really um, are following the Mediterranean diet in terms of, the tra in, in terms of traditional uh, aspects. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that's where I really see them following the, uh, the, that specific sort of pattern. Um, and, you know, obviously they have, they, they grew up in that environment, they, they know the specific types of uh, dietary patterns to consume. Um, and, and uh, I think that's where my, that's where I've seen most of the uh, patients uh, following the Mediterranean diet. You, you didn't, men I'm, I'm going to ask you this question because you're in Canada, you didn't mention anything about the PURE study, which is very controversial. And um, as you know, uh, diet, dairy and meat and chicken uh, didn't show increased uh, risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, yet refined sugars and uh, carbohydrates did. Do you want to make any comments on that? Um, yes, I think that uh, that's a very, uh, very uh, important comment, uh, Dr. Well. Uh, the, um, I, what I've noticed is that there is a trend now generally in, in patients who are very well informed, whether it's their, their source of information is the internet, and they really do understand the, uh, the implications of, of refined sugar consumption and seed oil consumption, and also um, generally uh, high intakes of carbohydrate leading to much more weight gain and insulin resistance. So I think uh, very the younger generation and uh, people who are really trying to lose weight on their own, their carbohydrate consumption is much lower and they are becoming more lenient in terms of healthy fat consumptions, including from dairy. Um, now, whether uh, I push them to move towards that is something which uh, I do have a discussion with them about that. And I tend to less, uh, I, I tend to stress less on uh, not consuming so much fat because really there is no evidence that you know healthy fats uh, has any impact on uh, mortality and cardiovascular disease. Ronnie, do you have any questions? Let me just unmute. Um, thank you both very much for um, wonderful talks. Um, uh, I guess a, a question for both of you, you know, there's a, there's, there's a little bit of overlap in a lot of this that, that I find, um, you know, a, a lot of the, the, the diet trials that have shown any positive effect have, have really in the end um, hovered around whole foods, real food. And that's kind of been one of the common themes. Um, you know, you can sit and sort of uh, get into the, um, the, the nitty gritty about the differences, but, um, you know, that is one of the commonalities. And and also, you know, um, Dr. Said, you actually mentioned that the timing of the meals were actually important when it comes to Mediterranean diet. And I don't think we talk about that a lot. And I wonder, you know, do we think that there's some of that overlap with some of this intermittent fasting, some of the calorie restriction or, or time restricted feeding really kind of falls into play? I mean, when you look historically, um, there's a lot of cultures that didn't eat breakfast. Actually, breakfast is somewhat of a new phenomenon and it, it wasn't around. So I just kind of wanted your thoughts on that. And then if you were to design a trial, I mean, what would be the right trial to design if possible, if you had a nice budget? Um, so thank you very much for the question. I think uh, briefly, I, you know, it's interesting that we are talking about intermittent fasting with, the, with, with various diet combinations. And I think it's important to stress uh, uh, you know, not eating too much later on in the evening. So the intermittent fasting essentially 
uh, patients avoid eating after 8 p.m. And, and really whether, whether breakfast is really beneficial or not in, in this caloric restriction and intermittent fasting uh, is, is something which we should look into. But I think 16 hour fasts with eating, uh, not eating during that period, you can consume water and caffeine related beverages. And really, uh, you know, the whole concept of eating five or six meals a day is something which we should think again and perhaps maybe eating two meals in the day, uh, one in the afternoon and one towards the end of the day. Um, and, you know, um, and obviously we can't really emphasize the same diet pattern on everyone, but I, you know, the driving factor for this intermittent fasting and the different types of diet is essentially insulin resistance, which is a big, big issue in, in a lot of patient population. And perhaps if we do see in our practice that we are seeing insulin resistance uh, cropping up in younger uh, patients, uh, this combination would be helpful for them. Yeah, and I think that there's um, the, I'm glad that you raised the point about the combination of the Mediterranean diet with timed eating. One of the challenges with the data that we have is actually their diets weren't controlled, right? So we don't know what they were eating. They were just told to eat between these hours. And if you looked in the control group of the TREAT trial, the second trial that I, I discuss, clearly the control group, you just had to tell them to eat the same time every day. And some people lost up to 7% of their weight, right? So, so I think that there's much more to it than, than just the timed eating, because we know uh, all of our other data shows that of course you, the, the whole foods and cutting out the refined carbohydrates are gonna be extremely important. So the ideal trial, is that you combine a healthy diet from a whole foods, you have um, non-refined carbohydrates included, you have healthy fats and a timed eating plus exercise, right? The other piece of this uh, that we're not talking about is exercise. So the people in the, ra in the, in the group that was randomized um, for the time-restricted eating, they decreased their amount of steps by over 2000 steps per day during the trial. So I think, and, and part of that muscle loss is probably explained by their lack of physical activity. So I think we need a combination, right? We, we eat and we move as humans, right? So if we had a trial that looked at a healthy diet under a timing, and if we would, could compare the evening timing, meaning the 12 to eight, or the afternoon, 12 to eight versus the morning, eight to three um, or eight to two, and, and including exercise, to me, that would be the best trial we could run to show whether or not this actually is effective for prevention. Great. Um, I think, um, Dr. Wadd, there's a couple um, questions from the audience. That I we think we, we, we can keep them later on because we're running out of time. Oh, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so uh, it gives me great pleasure now to, to introduce my co-host, Dr. Ronnie Shantouf. He's a consult, consultant interventional cardiologist here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. He uh, trained at UCLA in internal medicine and in cardiology. And prior to being with us, he was uh, working as a director of the cardiac catheterization laboratory uh, at UCLA. Although he is a uh, inter interventional cardiologist, he has a passion for prevention and particularly primary prevention. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about exercise for primary prevention. What should we recommend for our patients? Thank you very much for the introduction. And it's with pleasure that I'm able to give this next talk in regards to exercise for primary prevention. What should we recommend for our patients? I have no disclosures. In 2018, the WHO had a call to action in regards to insufficient physical activity, as it is one of the leading risk factors for death worldwide and on the rise in many countries. And as a country's gross national product increases, we see a drop in physical activity partly due to inaction during leisure time, sedentary behavior on the job and at home, and passive modes of transportation. The costs of inadequate physical activity are enormous, and the costs of the healthcare system have been as high as $54 billion worldwide in 2013, with $31 billion paid for by the public sector and near $13 billion by the private sector, near $10 billion by households. Physical and activity related deaths has resulted in nearly $14 billion in productivity losses and $13.4 million, million disability adjusted life years worldwide. We actually spend an average of less than 1% of our time performing moderate to vigorous activity. And this is substantially below the minimum recommendations. 
at least 25% of the world is not meeting even those minimum recommendations. And when we look at a country specific level, we see countries such as the UAE ranks as one of the highest for inactivity with 41% of its population not meeting the minimum WHO recommendations. So let's look at some of the data. Here are two meta-analyses looking at sitting time or TV viewing in relationship to all-cause mortality. And we see a dose response relationship to sedentary behavior with an increased sitting time correlated to increased mortality and increased TV viewing time correlated to increased mortality. And on the flip side, when looking at exercise, we see an overwhelming positive relationship. Depicted here is a meta-analysis looking at the association between walking cardiovascular mortality with an estimated 30% reduction in cardiovascular death. The Copenhagen City Heart Study is a large prospective study involving over 15,000 people. And here's a sub-study of 1,878 joggers looking at the impact on longevity. And we see here is jogging correlated with a reduction in all-cause mortality and increased survival with an age-adjusted 44% lower risk of death with increased survival out to six years for men and 5.6 years for women. And when adjusted for smoking, education, income, habits, drinking habits and diabetes, the finding remained robust with 3.8 and 4.7 years increase in survival in men and women respectively. In a prospective observational study of runners involving 55,000 adults with a mean age of 44, with a mean follow-up time of 15 years, we see runners had a 30% reduction in all-cause mortality and a 45% reduction in adjusted cardiovascular death. And there was a dose response benefit similar across quintiles of time, distance, frequency, amount, and speed. And all cause and cardiovascular mortality benefits were seen in essentially all subgroups. And compared to non runners, runners consistently had a redu reduced risk of all cause mortality and cardiovascular death. And this was true even at low dose or slow speeds associated, were also associated with significant mortality benefit. And, this pers and persistent runners over time were more strongly associated with mortality reduction. And again, looking at the Copenhagen City Heart, uh, City Heart Study, and now looking at a population of 8,577 people with a 25-year follow-up, this looked at different uh, uh, leisure time physical activities, and the study depicted the widely divergent life expectancies among different activities. And that all categories, however, of physical activity showed a mortality benefit, which apart from health club activities remains statistically significant when further adjusted for smoking, education, diabetes, and income. The activities with the most extensive and robust mortality reduction included soccer, badminton, and tennis, all social sports. Two theories as to why this may have had a, a stronger impact than the other activities is one, was this a social phenomenon involving multiple people? and social support and friends, or was it the type of activity in which it was interval burst activity in a sort of hit like type of exercise training? What about the coronary arteries in specific? There's a small study published in 1992, looking at 113 male patients with stable angina, 65% with prior myocardial infarctions in which they underwent coronary angiography. And they compared intense exercise and low fat diet versus usual care. And the exercise regimen included daily cycling of 30 minutes at 75% maximum predicted heart rate, plus 60 minutes of group training twice a week. And they had a follow up coronary angiography and perfusion study. And they found that the course of coronary artery disease was impacted by exercise and diet and that atherosclerosis on a patient basis slowed overall in the treatment group with less progression and more regression in the physical exercise and low fat diet arm. And that ischemia reduced in the treatment group even in patients that did not show regression on angiography, suggesting as we know that ischemia is not completely one-to-one -one compatible with the epicardial lesions themselves. And so the import, importance of exercise and exercise capacity cannot be underestimated. And in this study of 6,213 men referred for uh, exercise uh, treadmill testing for clinical reasons, uh, we see a, the impact of exercise capacity. This was a mean duration follow-up of 6.2 years with the endpoint of mortality. And after adjusting for age, we compared those 
normal subjects with those classified as having CAD based on either an abnormal treadmill test or CAD history. And independent of their CAD status, the risk of death decreased the greater the patient's exercise capacity. And that the absolute peak METs was the strongest predictor of death among both groups. And for every one MET, we saw a survival increase of 12%, regardless of CAD status. And so how do we categorize intensity? It's important to know your patient because one patient uh, is brisk walking can be light versus another patient that might be a vigorous activity based on their level of deconditioning. And there are three major ways. One is by absolute METs, such as a treadmill testing or relative uh, intensity based on uh, percent of your maximum predicted heart rate or the talk test. I find the talk test is very helpful and useful, especially in clinic and when starting patients on a new exercise program. And so to use a talk test, if the patient's able to sing while performing the activity, consider that light intensity. If they're able to talk comfortably but not sing, that's a moderate level of activity. And if talking is a difficult task during the activity, you consider that a vigorous level of intensity. This can help the patient uh, follow a, a, a exercise program and track their progression. And here are some examples based on absolute METs of different levels of uh, activity, such as jogging, running, biking, singles tennis are all considered vigorous versus a brisk walk is a moderate level of activity. And so the 2019 ACC AHA guidelines on primary prevention of cardiovascular disease has four key recommendations for exercise. One is that adults should be routinely counseled in healthcare visits to optimize a physically active lifestyle. Two, adults should engage in at least 150 minutes per week of accumulated moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity to reduce ASCVD risk. And three, adults who are unable to meet the minimum physical activity requirements should still engage in some level of moderate or vigorous intense physical activity, even if it's less than the recommended amount, as studies have shown that this can still be beneficial to their risk reduction. And four, they should decrease sedentary behavior as this may reasonably reduce ASCVD risk. And so James O'Keefe and colleagues published a, a, a paper in regard talking about the Goldilocks zone, not too little, not too much. This is a, a step-by-step uh, approach to exercise uh, uh, prescription essentially, and where there's no upper threshold for low to moderate intense activity. However, one should limit the dose of vigorous exercise to no more than four to five, time, four to five cumulative hours per week and that we should at least take one day off from vis vigorous activity. And those with very high exercisers greater than the age of 50 should consider a cardiac evaluation. And so if we were to compare ourselves to our Paleolithic ancestors in which they walked and ran five to 10 miles or eight to 16 kilometers a day and lifted, carried, climbed and stretched, that would be equivalent to us cross training with aerobics resistance and flexibility exercise. I hope this is helpful as and will serve as a guideline and a prescription for our patients. Thank you. All right, so um, we're gonna slightly shift gears away from impact of, on lifestyle and cardiovascular health and move towards medication-based therapies. And so it is with great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Leslie Cho, is an expert and director of Cleveland Clinic's Women's Cardiovascular Center. She's also the section head of preventive cardiology and rehabilitation and the chief quality officer in the Heart, Vascular, and Thoracic Institute at Cleveland Clinic main campus. She's a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner School of Medicine, Case Western Reserve Medical School, and is board certified in interventional cardiology, cardiovascular medicine, and internal medicine. Her research has garnered her many grants to study various therapeutic treatments for heart disease, and she is the author and co-author of numerous peer-reviewed papers in leading medical journals and has authored medical chapters and textbooks. Dr. Cho's clinical research interests are women in heart disease and the role of nutrition in hypercholesterolemia. Thus, it is with great pleasure to welcome Dr. Leslie Cho, who will be talking about a recurrent and pertinent topic in regards to statin therapy.
Hello, my name is Leslie Cho. I'm a professor of medicine, section head of preventive cardiology and cardiac rehabilitation at Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland, Ohio. It's my pleasure to be with you today to talk about myalgia on statins. Now what? It's a very common problem that we all face. These are my conflict of interest. We all live in a very strange time, but hopefully I can see all of you face to face someday. If you look at randomized control studies, muscle-related statin symptoms are extremely rare, extremely low rates of myalgia, myositis, and rhabdo. And if you look at the meta-analysis, 35 randomized control studies, 74,000 patients, there was really no difference in myalgia, CK elevation, rhabdo, or discontinuation of statins. But myalgia was only reported in 21 studies, CK was reported in only 16, and no atorvastatin trial ever reported CKs. And we all know randomized control study usually pick the healthiest of patient population. In the real world, the myalgia rates are much higher, 5 to 10% associated with myalgia on statins. If you look at the PRIMO study, which is a French outpatient-based <clears throat> high-dose statin study, it's around 10%. Kaiser, which is a health maintenance organization in the US, it's around 5 to 7%. Unfortunately, there is no definition of myalgia. But what, and if you look at the ACC, AHA, NHLBI, the National Lipid Association, the FDA, no one can agree on what myalgia, myopathy, uh, myositis. Uh, definitions are. Everyone agrees what rhabdo is, but myalgia really, there is unfortunately no simple test, no simple blood test to distinguish. And so thus comes the confusion. The risk factors for getting uh, myalgia on statin is related to patients as well as treatment. So patient related um, effects are things like age. So elderly patients, females are more likely to have it. Smaller patients and frailer patients are more likely to have myalgias on statins. Also things like hypothyroidism can really increase your risk of having myalgias. Family history is another important cause. There are some genetic predisposition. Excessive physical activity, major surgery, perioperative times can also increase that risk as well as um, alcohol intake. There's obviously treatment related uh, issues with myalgia, high dose statins, definitely more than low dose statins. And then there are interactions with other drugs. So these are the most common drug interactions that can cause myalgias with statin therapies. Things that we normally use in cardiology, such as fibrates, verapamil and diltiazem, calcium channel blockers, amiodarone, uh, colchicine, digoxin, coumadin, they can all increase the risk of myalgias. And then obviously we all know about the antifungals and the mac macrolide antibiotics, and then for our HIV patients, the protease inhibitors can really um, increase the risk of myalgia. It's really important to remember that there are other things like alcohol and sometimes herbal pseudical medicines that people are taking that can increase the risk as well. I don't know anyone that drinks greater than one quart of grape juice, but if a grapefruit juice, but if you're one of those, then that increases your risk. The factors favoring statin myopathy are you should be, if it's really related to a statin, it usually occurs in large muscle groups, a large proximal symmetric muscle groups. So bilateral thigh pain, bilateral buttock pain, bilateral shoulder or upper arm pain. It's worse with exercise. Usually starts within two weeks of statins initiation, resolves within two weeks after statin is discontinued. And um, it is it is not associated with any kind of pain, vibration, or position, or sensory deficits. You have to have normal creatinine kinase, TSH, sed rate, and CRP, and vitamin D level to really say you have statin-induced myalgia. There are uh, statins that are worse in terms of causing myalgia. So um, lipophilic statins, so statins that go passively everywhere and non-selectively, they definitely have increased risk. So simvastatin, fluvastatin, those are the worst ones, and atorvastatin. And then the hydrophilic statin are less likely to cause um, 
uh, myalgia. So hydrophilic statins are, they need active transport into the hepatocytes. So rosuvastatin and pravastatin are the good ones. So we've tested the hypothesis of using um, a hydrophilic statin for patients with statin-induced myalgia. So these were patients um, intolerant to two or more statins. We made sure that it was not drug-to-drug -drug interaction. We made sure it wasn't, uh, they were not hypothyroid. We looked at all the sorts of other factors. And these were people who really had myalgias on statins. 1,600 patients, and we started them on rosuvastatin. And the, re and the reason why we chose rosuvastatin is because rosuvastatin has a very long half-life. We initially started with twice a week at, at a low dose, and if they were able to tolerate, then increase the intermittent statin dosing. So you either do Monday or Thursday, where you have a couple of days in between, and if they were able to tolerate that for two months, we either increase the dose or we increase the frequency to get them to their LDL goal. And in this case, the LDL goal was based on whether they were primary prevention or secondary prevention. So either they were LDL less than 70 or LDL uh, less than 100 or uh, 130. So for most people who are statin intolerant, we were able to get them to daily dose of hydrophilic statins. There were patients who were absolutely unable to tolerate statin, and that was around 40% of, I mean, around 30% of the 1,600 patients. And the rest were able to do intermittent statin dosing and still be a goal. So I think one of the most important things to come out of this study is that you can do intermittent statin dosing twice a week initially, low dose resuvastatin, and to challenge, re-challenge these patients. So how do we treat? We do a careful history and physical. We make sure that these patients are not dr drinking a lot of alcohol, may not, that they're not on any herbal pseudical medicines that can interfere. We make sure that there is no drug interaction. And then we try hydrophilic statin intermittent dosing every um, Monday and Thursday, and then we increase the dose or we increase the frequency depending on their tolerability. And if they're not at goal, then we do PCSK9 inhibitors or we do Zetia. And we do Zetia not only for patient preference. There are patients who really don't want to take um, injections. And for them, I think Zetia makes sense. Um, uh, but in the, in the era of PCSK9, I think for majority of patients, it's really PCSK9 inhibitors. So as you know, PCSK9's lower LDL by 50 to 60%. There's two that's approved, Rupatha and Priolent. They're both monoclonal antibodies. They inhibit LDL receptors from breaking down, and that's why they have such an amazing um, efficacy. They are incredibly safe. Um, the Fourier study, which is cardiovascular outcome study, which was positive, as well as Odyssey outcomes, which is a cardiovascular outcome study, which was again positive, both showed incredible safety in terms of no uh, increasing diabetes or neurocognitive effect or cataract or allergic reaction, really just a very, very safe drug. And even if your LDL is less than 20, these patients were um, did not have neurocognitive deficits and they did not have muscle side effects. What about anything new? So there are two new things on the horizon. One is bempedoic acid. And the second is in glycerin. Bempedoic acid it, um, works two steps above where statins work. So statins are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor. These are ACL inhibitors, and they prevent cholesterol from forming. They are um, um, they have been studied in patient patient statin tolerance. It is an oral drug. It's once a day, small molecule. Half life is around 15 to 24 hours. The target organ is the liver minimal metabolism, um, and it's been approved by the FDA. Bempedoic acid by itself only lowers LDL by 15%, but bempedoic acid plus Zetia lowers LDL by 30%. The cardiovascular outcome trial is pending. Um, the Cleveland Clinic is the uh, primary investigator for the 12,000 patient study. In glycerin, which is a small interfering RNA or silent interfering RNAs um, against the formation of PCSK9 inhibitors, you inject every 90 days. Um, 
uh, as the Orion studies have shown, there are uh, phase three study, Orion 10 and 11, however, uh, and it is pending FDA approval. The cardiovascular outcome study on Orion 4 is pending. So in conclusion, really good physical and history. We're lucky to be in an era where we have lots of options for people with myalgia, but you have to make sure that this is really from a statin because really there's no medicine quite like a statin in terms of lowering cardiovascular risk. But if they are truly intolerant, then intermittent statin dosing, you can add Zetia if they are against taking an injection. But PCSK9 inhibitors, I think, are really the go-to drug. Thank you for your attention. As we're running out of time, do you want to present Melinda, Ronnie, and then we'll catch up on the questions? All right, so I think um, to, for, for time's sake, what we'll do is we'll go to our next speaker and then we'll, um, um, we'll uh, move to a discussion and we'll catch up. So um, our next speaker, Dr. Millen Desai, is the Director of Clinical Operations of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Seidel and Arnold Miller Family Heart, Vascular and Thoracic Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. And he holds a dual appointment in the Departments of Cardiovascular Medicine and Radiology. He's an expert in multimodality cardiovascular imaging and has achieved the highest level of proficiency in all imaging modalities, including cardiac MR, cardiac CT, echocardiography, and nuclear cardiology. His research interests include large outcome studies in valvular heart disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, radiation heart disease, coronary heart disease, and aortic di disorders. He's also an active researcher in non-invasive imaging using advanced echocardiography, CT and MR, and stress testing in patients with valvular heart disease. He uh, also studies outcome assessments using multimodality imaging and ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And so this ne next topic really serves as a crossroads between cardiac imaging and preventive cardiology, tackling the questions surrounding the power of a zero calcium score. Thus, it's with great pleasure to welcome Dr. Millen Desai. Hello, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I shall be discussing the, con the concept of elevated lipids and what do you do when your calcium score is zero. I will also discuss in, uh, a little bit of data related to coronary artery calcium scoring. I'm Malin Desai from uh, Cleveland Clinic at, in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, and I have no relevant financial conflicts of interest. So let us start with a case. <clears throat> this is a 57-year-old Caucasian male executive that I saw a few years ago. He was a non-smoker in excellent health, asymptomatic, exercising five days a week. He underwent an EKG stress test as part of his physical, where he did 10 mets, ostensibly did very well, family medical history negative, and his lipids, I think at that time, were slightly better than mine. His LDL was... Uh, 98, HDL was 59, total cholesterol was 160. His CRP was negative. And as you would calculate his risk score, uh, it was 3.9% 10 year risk. <clears throat> so all in all, patient was doing great. Except when you did his calcium score, his cal he had substantial calcium in his left main RCA and LAD territory, which was uh, at 97th percentile based on age, gender, and ethnicity. Uh, and his 10-year MESA risk score without calcium was 3.4, but with calcium uh, ended up being 9%. So a little surprise. So let's uh, segue into coronary calcium scoring. Essentially, this is done via a non-contrast uh, CT, a CAT scan of the heart where a calcific lesion is supposed to be something that is bright, hyperattenuating more than 130 Hounsfield units with an area of three pixels. And essentially you can divide the folks into zero with no calcific atherosclerosis and more than 400 uh, with severe calcific coronary atherosclerosis. The three pictures here, no calcium on the left, small amount of calcium in the middle and dense calcification in the middle at the, on the right. <clears throat> so, However, with calcium coronary calcification, you have to uh, not only know the absolute number, but uh, know uh, that you have that age, gender, and ethnicity uh, play a role in how much calcification you have. And this was shown to us by the MESA study. 
pound for pound, Caucasians have more calcification than, than Chinese Americans. And it does provide incremental prognostic value. This is almost 7,000 patients from MESA study divided on in four ethnicities. What it showed was if your calcium score is zero, your long-term outcomes are great. If your calcium score is greater than 300, then not so great. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, additionally, this data was proven uh, in additional cohorts, including one from Europe, the Heinz Next Dorf recall study, as well as the coronary artery calcification uh, consortium. And thousands and thousands of patients where coronary calcification provides incremental prognostic value. Coronary calcification, as you compare it to other risk factors like CRP, carotid intima media thickness, flow mediated dilation, family history, et cetera, coronary artery calcification does substantially better, providing a much bigger area under the curve compared to some of these other well established markers. Even in folks with intermediate risk without evidence of diabetes, this is part of the MESA study. Also, uh, another sub-study from MESA, if you take patients with normal, I mean, LDL less than 130, but evidence of inflammation with CRP greater than two milligrams uh, per liter, even their cal calcium score provides uh, incremental prognostic value such that if your calcium score is zero, despite being inflamed, your long-term outcomes are much better versus if your calcium score is more than 100. So how do we incorporate calcium scoring in our practice? It, it is my opinion that we should not pay attention only to the absolute calcium score, but you have to have a gender race, age, race and gender based percentile score taking into account other risk scores. So we typically use the MESA risk calculator and it has been shown that it provides incremental prognostic value even when you use uh, multiple different databases. This study demonstrated that uh, it works very well in the Dallas Heart Study as well as Heinz Next Door Study. Now, the important thing is how do you handle a, you order a calcium score and the calcium score happens to be zero. So if your calcium score is zero, it results in the greatest downward shift of estimated cardiovascular risk compared to all the other factors like IMT or family history or high risk CRP, uh, high sensitivity CRP. So it is a very powerful tool as it turns in terms of risk reclassification. This is another sub-study from MESA on almost 250 patients with LDL greater than 190, so severely elevated LDL. What it shows was if your calcium score happens to be zero, then your risk for cardiovascular events is, is substantially lower versus your calcium score is elevated. So even in hyperlipidemic patients, it provides incremental prognostic value. The other, uh, this is another, uh, almost 13,000 patients uh, followed for almost 10 years. If your calcium score is zero, top left panel, adding statin therapy uh, did not provide incremental prognostic value. Versus if your calcium score is more than 400, it provided significant uh, prognostic value. Uh, same for calcium score greater than 100. So in 5,000 MESA participants, uh, the number needed to prevent an event with no lipid abnormality, but your calcium score greater than 100 was 30. Versus if you have a calcium score of zero uh, and three lipid abnormalities, the number needed to treat was 154, suggesting that coronary calcification is a much more powerful tool of risk stratification uh, compared to lipid abnormalities. So this begets a question, how do you handle uh, statins and coronary artery calcification? Assume you would calculate your uh, atherosclerotic risk score and you have no, no coronary artery calcification done, then you are stuck with guideline directed therapy versus if you have calcification, coronary artery calcification done and if your calcium score is zero, then you can downgrade the risk and potentially defer a statin. If your calcium score is greater than zero, then you upgrade the risk and add stat. Indeed, this is a study from the Cleveland Clinic, almost 1,800 patients, asymptomatic. Uh, what we were able to show that 
addition of calcium scoring to standard risk assessment uh, upgrades or downgrades the risk in about 40% of patients. And 25% of subjects would have been recommended for long-term st statin therapy based on the risk score. But indeed, all these 25% patients had zero calcium score. So potentially we could have avoided uh, calcification, uh, statin therapy in some of these patients based on the data that I just showed. So selected examples of who might benefit from knowing the calcium score to be zero, patients who are reluctant to initiate statin, patients concerned about uh, statin therapy uh, due to statin-associated symptoms, older patients with low risk factors, and middle-aged patients with atherosclerotic risk score less than uh, uh, between 5% to 7.5%, uh, uh, and who are bo essentially borderline patients. So what is our suggested approach to using coronary calcium scoring? It is recommended in asymptomatic individuals greater than 40 with intermediate risk, uh, atherosclerotic risk. Uh, in borderline risk patients between five and 7.5% risk, especially if they have a family history of premature CAD. Uh, aggressive lifestyle changes, risk modification and statin are recommended in uh, calcium score greater than 100 or 75th percentile based on age and gender. And then if your calcium scores are lower, then patient preference and shared decision-making is recommended. Calcium scoring is not recommended in low risk or ultra high risk or symptomatic patients. If your calcium score is zero, then there's emerging data that statin therapy does not really add much value unless there are major cardiovascular risk factors. And uh, to assess statin treatment efficacy, you do not, uh, it is not recommended to do repeat coronary artery calcification. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Is Melinda on? Yes. Hi, Melinda. Thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, if you have a patient with a high LDL and the calcium score is zero, would you repeat this, the calcium score in the future or, or no need? Yeah, if so so if you're especially, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, this is great. Uh, if your calcium score is zero, then it makes sense to repeat it in about five years or so. Most of us would do that. Now, the, the concept of my score last time was 100, now I'm on statin, is let me see if it has dropped down to 80. That is the wrong one. So if you are anything over zero, I think you are, uh, it, it really doesn't add much. But if you are uh, at calcium score is zero, then yes, I would recommend repeating it in about five years. That's what at least uh, the folks uh, recommend doing. Ronnie, are you on? Ronnie, you're on mute. Yeah. There we go. All right. Um, so I have a follow-up question in regards to that. I think this is a very interesting topic. That um, So one of the questions that came from uh, the audience was, um, so a lot of the data um, on the association between coronary calcium, statin therapy, and death is observational. And so there's always a subject to con confounding um, by these indications. So any thoughts uh, in regards to that and how, how we should interpret that versus just looking at a lot of the you know, more pure randomized trials with statins in the past? Yeah, you are absolutely right. I mean, you know, unfortunately, uh, most of this data is, is observational, but these are prospective, well-defined, well-meaning uh, observational study. There are observational studies and there are observational studies. I mean, a lot of what we do in life comes out of Framingham uh, data or the Reynolds data. Uh, the MESA study is a very, uh, is one of the better, uh, more uh, firmer uh, observational study. Having said that, yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, the purest form of data is is that of a randomized control trial. And especially as it relates to calcium scoring, et cetera, we do not have randomized control trial vis-a-vis -vis statin therapy. You are absolutely right. But, you know, there's a lot of things we do in life where there are no real observation, I mean, uh, randomized control trials. So um, I, I have a follow-up question. So, you know, I, uh, 
Are there any select high risk groups where you'd be less reliant on the calcium score that you're worried about? I mean, for example, out here in, in, in um, at uh, CCAD, we see a lot of South Asians and Middle Eastern. You know, at least I find on a personal, and I think a lot of our colleagues agree here at CCAD that we see a lot of coronary uh, disease at an earlier age. And so, you know, you get a 42 year old, 43 year old with a calcium score of zero. How much can we, you know, hang our hat on something like that? Agree. So, couldn't agree more. The three of us who are on camera right now would probably, I mean, you know, South Asian descent and Middle Eastern descent, we would be uh, clearly uh, in the higher risk group. And which is why the, the asterisk is uh, the MESA study did not include uh, this population. So, and now the demographics are shifting, absolutely, which is why one of the comments I made is, especially if you have symptoms, then that's calcium scoring is not going to be your reassuring factor. If you have a young person with symptoms, that person you don't look for, you don't just go back to bed if their calcium score is zero. I mean, you have to take them into account. Having said that, even in asymptomatic individuals, to be very frank, certain ethnicity, Southeast Asian, a Middle Eastern, uh, the smaller vessels, diabetics, pre-diabetic, uh, pre those folks, they probably, you know, if I have a patient in that category with major lipid abnormalities, I'm not going to talk them out of getting statins. To be very frank, if you have a reason to be on statin, there needs to be a good reason to not be on statin to uh, get off of it. That's the way I look at it. And, and, you know, yes, this emerging data on calcium and the power of zero is, is compelling, but still, I would imagine most of us would still... If your LDL is more than 150, what have you, and you have family history of premature CAD and you're a pre-diabetic, you're so much better off being on statin where there is a ton of data. Now you come, you know, you come to Leslie Cho and say, my legs are hurting and my I have substantial myalgia. And she confirms that it is not really due to, I mean, it is due to statin myopathy. And then, then a reasonable argument can be made. Hey, your calcium score is zero. You have no symptoms. We have looked you over. Uh, maybe let's get you off of it for a little bit, see how things go. So, you know, uh, it is shared decision making. I, I think, you know, sending person for a therapy or rather adding a statin therapy should be such a part of our psyche that that should happen. In my opinion, getting somebody off of statin because of a score of zero, what have you, should be realistically shared decision making, where the patient buys into that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Belinda. We'll continue now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hani Sabur. Dr. Hani needs no uh, presentation. You know him very well. He'll be talking about should a cardiologist have a role in diabetic care and coronary artery disease patients. Dr. Hani uh, graduated from uh, Kuwait, and then he certified in um, internal medicine, cardiac electrophysiology, heart failure, and transplant. He has a lot of interests, and um, currently he is running our uh, cardiometabolic uh, clinic, which is a new type of clinic, multi-speciality. And so Hani, please go ahead and tell us what is the role of the cardiologist? My name is Hani Sabor. It's uh, my pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar series uh, focused on preventive cardiology. The title of my talk is Should Cardiologists Manage Diabetes in Cardiovascular Disease Patients? And this should serve as an introduction to cardiometabolic medicine. I'm a consultant cardiologist and assistant professor of cardiology. These are my disclosures relevant to this presentation. The learning objectives initially to uh, define the overlap between diabetes and cardiovascular disease and CKD and the urgent need to establish cardiometabolic medicine as a new specialty. And secondly, to determine what are cardiometabolic therapies and what is a cardiometabolic clinic and to differentiate this from the existing endocrinology or cardiology clinics. Looking at the volume of patients and encounters at large uh, US medical centers, it's fairly clear that type 2 diabetic patients 
who do not have um, clear cardiovascular disease are seen about 50% of the time, 73,000 encounters in cardiology, and less in endocrinology. Of course, the majority of visits are in primary care. However, in patients with type 2 diabetes and CVD, the majority of their visits, as you can see here, 63,000 visits are actually seen by the cardiologist and the primary care physician. So there is a clear number of patients that have both cardiovascular disease and diabetes and diabetics who see the cardiologist. Are we therefore well-equipped enough to take care of these exploding numbers of cardiometabolic disorders? So these are some sobering statistics in the um, United States, 34 million people, uh, about one in 10 are diabetic. Divided by the number of uh, endocrinologists in the United States, that's about 4,500 patients per endocrinologist, not visits. On the other hand, there are about 22,000 cardiologists and 113,000 family medicine and primary care doctors. So I think regardless of the specialty, we don't have enough bandwidth or physicians to actually deal with all of the complications of diabetes. Now, coming back to the actual title of the topic, so we have the cardiologist and we have the endocrinologist and primary care physician. And of course, there is the broken link because there is a difference in viewpoint between cardiologists and endocrinologists and PCPs. And unfortunately, there are turf battles that are actual barriers to the proper care of the diabetes patient and certainly the diabetes patient with cardiovascular disease. So there are certain different approaches between cardiologists and endocrinologists to a patient with diabetes. Cardiologists are now focused on utilizing cardiovascular outcome studies to initiate medications that reduce cardiovascular events in patients with ASCVD, heart failure, and CKD. In diabetes, our traditional function in cardiology was to treat hypertension, lipids, and exercise counseling. Previously, we really couldn't do much with diabetes. Now, over the last five to six years, we can recommend to the PCP or the endocrinologist to start SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists in cardiovascular disease patients because of their tremendous impact on hard cardiac outcomes. From the endocrinologist standpoint, until recently, again, it's a glucocentric worldview, uh, receptive to glycemic control, in which A1C goal was important, diet, weight management, and counseling, and surveillance of microvascular complications was the standard of care. Now, can we do better by combining this? So these conceptual differences are important, and they come back from how people are trained. In cardiology, there was very little training in terms of diabetes management. There is concern about referrals and who's going to take care of the patients. There is a lot of innovation in cardiology and therefore new medications, drug interactions, patient safety are important. And of course, we don't have the infrastructure for diabetes educators that the endocrinology clinic has. Endocrinology requires individualization of care and CVOTs may be either too wide or oversimplistic in terms of the general diabetes population. Many diabetologists are less comfortable in treating non-diabetics with cardiovascular disease, which again, the new CVOTs have shown us. And of course, adjustment of diuretic doses in patients who are SGLT2 inhibitors who have heart failure as well. So there is clearly gaps in the training and background of both groups. Now, why is this clinically important? Because if you look at these two very large studies, these are real world studies, CVD real one and two, the first one had 150,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, and the second had 230 patients with type 2 diabetes. Across the board, the US, uh, in the use of the SGLT2 inhibitors in both primary and secondary prevention, there was a 50% reduction of all cause mortality, almost a 40% reduction of heart failure hospitalization, and combining both, somewhere between 40 and 50% reductions as well. In addition, in CVD Real 2, there was a significant reduction of MI and stroke as well with SGLT2 inhibition. What about GLP-1 receptor agonists? So these are now <clears throat> more recent studies where patients who are using GLP-1 receptor agonists extending their benefit beyond glycemic control into cardiovascular safety and efficacy. And this is using liraglutide versus um, xenotide, comparing that to other agents. So again, there's a tremendous amount of data that these two sets of drugs have a tremendous impact in cardiovascular outcome. Now, in terms of the indication, the numbers are staggering. 
So about a third of Americans with diabetes have renal disease and therefore are eligible for SGLT2 inhibitor therapy based on <clears throat> clinical studies and clinical indications published in the guidelines. Well, how much of this is actually being translated into reality? Actually, only a handful of patients are getting the latest evidence-based cardiometabolic therapy. So this is a large US-based registry. And in fact, in patients with ASCVD, CKD, or heart failure who had diabetes, only 9% of the patients were getting the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors and 7% from GLP-1 receptor agonists. On the other hand, at least one-fifth were receiving sulfonylurea that actually has no benefit and may in fact have harm in these patients. Who are the people who are actually taking on the prescription of SGLT2 inhibitors? So in fact, looking at the prescription audits and the Brigham and Women study on the left side, it's entirely clear that only 5% of these SGLT2 prescriptions, which are drugs that are now well utilized in the heart failure space, as well as diabetes, the minority is being done by cardiologists, where the majority is being done by PCPs and internal medicine physicians. How about GLP-1 receptor agonists? Again, 5% of the GLP-1 receptors agonists, which are highly effective in reducing myocardial infarction and, my, and cardiovascular death rates in patients with ASCVD and diabetes, less than 1% in the national prescription audit by cardiologists, the majority by endocar endocrinologists and PCPs. So a cardiometabolic clinic actually combines the benefits of both types of training and both types of approaches. This would be focusing on primordial, primary and secondary prevention. In addition, lifestyle, diet, obesity, and diabetes teaching, cardiac and diabetes risk assessment, optimization and management, looking at medication optimization, the appropriate imaging and procedural services. And in addition, mobile health technologies, tracking home lab parameters and following up patients and giving alerts that prevent readmission. It is a comprehensive care model. And therefore, in the outpatient cardiology setup alone without modification is not in fact optimal for treating or teaching patients with cardiometabolic disease. And this model has been published last year by Michael Blaha and uh, Bob Eckel, an endocrinologist and a cardiologist. The cardiometabolic clinic should encompass all of these items, including imaging, prevention, support of diabetes management, optimizing medication plans, planning treatment, as well as lifestyle counseling and risk assessment, plus exercise and smoking cessation, and specific diets. The cardiometabolic team centers on the cardiometabolic physician who has an interest in both cardiology and metabolic disorders, nurses that are specialized, diabetes educators or um, nutritionists, behavioral psychologists, and pharmacists. The characteristics of a cardiometabolic physician combine the benefits of both types of training, diagnosing and treating cardiometabolic disease, start and titrate guideline-directed medical therapy. CV risk assessment and management is integral as well as cardiac imaging and procedures, counseling family and patients, teaching and training staff, and also specific research activities along this pathway. The success of this model has been demonstrated from um, the Mid-America Institute by Mikhail Kusimorod. This was presented um, in the um, Diabetes Congress uh, December of last year. The Cardiometabolic Center Alliance is essentially this patient-centered approach where the comprehensive treatment plans include both cardiovascular and diabetes-related aspects of care at each visit and a comprehensive treatment plan tailored to individuals with the objective of reduction of secondary risk aggressively. And this is some of the results at St. Luke's and this registry was also presented uh, late last year. So those patients enrolled in the cardiometabolic clinic were matched with similar patients with a conventional clinic model. So as you see here in the cardiometabolic clinic, there was a significant reduction of the weight, 15 pounds versus minus two in the conventional clinic a significant reduction of the A1C by 0.5, significant reduction of the blood pressure by 4.6, and significant change in the LDL cholesterol by 11.4, although it didn't meet statistical significance over the period of time. Most importantly, the use of guideline-directed medical therapy was much higher in 
the um, cardiometabolic clinic than compared to control. So 56% of patients compared to 18 getting SGLT2 inhibitors, almost 90% of patients getting GLP-1 receptor agonists, 30% getting ACEs and ARBs, ARBs were no different. Statin therapy, about a 15% um, advantage, high intensity statin and overall guideline directed medical therapy was very different, 41% versus 2.3% in the conventional clinics. So in summary, despite a revolution in diabetes and CVD care, physicians have been slow to adopt these therapies from both sides of the aisle. We have excellent new cardiology and diabetes guidelines, but conventional clinic models are poorly suited for this change. The cardiometabolic clinic will be the medical home for the patient and will be de facto comprehensive specialty primary care as well as secondary care. And by centralization of care, we'll reduce the need for other specialty referrals, increase efficiency, decrease costs, and have impact on mortality and morbidity as well. Thank you, Hani. That was very nice. Um, are you online? Yes, I'm right here. Great. Uh, tell me, what are the challenges do you think you're going to face in starting a clinic like this? So I think uh, buy-in from all of the stakeholders is very important. I think we have to realize that our objective is uh, not to treat an organ, but treat the whole patient and prevent cardiovascular risk. So I think what we've learned in cardiology, we used a lot of tools like coronary calcium score, like uh, advanced lipid profiling in order to identify the high risk and the very high risk patients. So that's where I think we have the, you know, that experience, but we also have to learn about these new agents and how to insert them into the treatment algorithm just as much as you would use a statin in any cardiovascular disease patient, I think we now have two or three other agents that reduce cardiovascular risk in ASCVD, heart failure, heart, and uh, other um, risk equivalents. So I think getting the buy-in, getting the uh, patients to understand it's a comprehensive risk-based program. Excellent. One of the other issues we face here is using the medications, obviously, in the United Arab Emirates, obviously, and particularly for obesity, uh, are the obesity medications. Do you want to make a comment on that? Sure. I mean, I think we've talked about this, uh, you know, numerous times. The upstream treatment of obesity leads to decreasing metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, cardiovascular disease. And in fact, it's, it's very rampant here. We've seen, uh, as you've seen also, um, all of these adolescents and teenagers who are morbidly obese and plus they're smoking. So I think it's sort of a national imperative in the region to sort of move the upstream treatment to avoid the genesis of diabetes. Prevention of diabetes at a young age should be very important. Problem is we have this issue with the insurer here that has somehow removed all obesity medications from the covered list, which I think is a very short-sighted view, because in the end, if you manage this upfront, you have less diabetes in a country that already has a fifth of its patients as diabetes, and all of the subsequent events that are going to occur 20 to 40 years later. Um, uh, Dr. Hani, I've got a question from the audience. Uh, what about the use of um, SGLP1 for non-diabetics, but cardiovascular patients? Any thoughts? So in heart failure, this is very well established. I think we've had two very large clinical studies, which is DAPA-HF and Emperor reduced So 50% of those patients enrolled in randomized clinical studies were non-diabetics, and there was an equal benefit in reduction of heart failure hospitalization. In uh, CKD patients, for sure, DAPA-CKD demonstrated this without a doubt, Diabetic and non-diabetic patients across the board with mild and moderate CKD, actually there was a reduction of worsening of CKD. And as you reduce CKD, you reduce cardiovascular death. So this is a very proportionate relationship, more CKD, more cardiovascular death. So directly and indirectly. So I think it's coming uh, in heart failure for sure. This is an approved indication in CKD. I think it's gonna come very soon. And I think ultimately, as we look at the patients with ASCVD who don't have diabetes, I'm not sure where that study is gonna come from. But, uh, you know, I think there is something to be said about how these um, uh, cellular mechanisms work to protect the myocardium. And GLP-1 receptor agonists actually um, are, are being used in large-scale studies in obesity who don't have cardiovascular disease and don't have diabetes. So we're going to see exactly how this plays out. But this is fascinating in terms of uh, new mechanisms for cardiovascular prevention beyond statins and aspirin. Thank you very much, Dr. Haney. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Luke Laffin, who's a physician in the preventive cardiology and rehabilitation section in the Robert and Susan uh, Tomsich Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, Seidel and Arnold Miller Family Heart, Vascular and Thoracic Institute at Cleveland Clinic. 
He was named to be Cleveland Clinic staff in 2018 and is a clinical specialist in hypertension as certified by the American Heart Association and directs the resistant hypertension clinic and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring clinic within the Heart, Vascular and Thoracic Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Laffin has published widely in the field of preventive cardiology, mainly on the diagnosis and management of hypertension. And he has given multiple invited national and international lectures in the field of preventive cardiology. Hypertensive treatment and management, of course, is one of the key cornerstones in preventive medicine with multiple modalities available, both pharmacologically and non-pharmacologically. Thus, please welcome Dr. Luke Laffin. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Uh, my name is Luke Laffin, and I'm a preventive cardiologist at the main campus of the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And what I was asked to speak about today was the expected impact of lifestyle modification on high blood pressure. Um, here are my disclosures. Really the learning objectives for today's 10 minute talk are to number one, understand guideline recommendations for lifestyle modifications to treat hypertension. Number two, understand the impact of specific lifestyle interventions on blood pressure lowering. And then number three, we'll end by talking about some strategies to help patients implement these lifestyle uh, interventions. Probably the most important thing that we as clinicians have to realize is that hypertension management is more about lifestyle than it is medications. I always tell my patients it's about 70% lifestyle, 30% medications. So just writing that script for a, a calcium channel block or a diuretic isn't gonna cut it. And I think many of us are familiar with the different lifestyle interventions that are, um, that are out there and that are uh, talked about in the guidelines. And so we'll go into them a little bit further. So really what I wanna to touch on in the remaining time here is highlight some of the contemporary American and European guidelines for lifestyle uh, blood pressure interventions. Talk more in depth about dietary sodium reduction, healthy dietary patterns, and then end with a component talking about sleep quality, quantity, and how it impacts blood pressure. So the most important slide that you're going to see from my presentation is here, okay? And this is a modified version of a text-heavy table from the American Blood Pressure Guidelines. Um, and this shows how much blood pressure lowering we get in hypertensive individuals and normotensive individuals by implementing certain lifestyle changes, like losing weight, undertaking a heart-healthy diet, Lowering sodium, for example, if you see it, it's third from the left there, um, you lower on the average person systolic blood pressure by about five to six uh, millimeters of mercury, okay? So these are really important, and these are the hallmark of lifestyle interventions for lowering blood pressure. These have been replicated in every uh, American blood pressure guideline since 2003, and they are all class 1A recommendations. So we can't just be prescribing medicines. We really need to focus on getting people physically active, different types of uh, activity, limiting alcohol, et cetera. Now, the European guidelines also talk a lot about lifestyle recommendations. And again, these are all class 1A recommendations. The only real difference that we see between the guidelines is um, when we talk about a healthy dietary pattern, for blood pressure reduction. The focus in the American guidelines is more on the DASH diet, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and in a European guidelines, they're more focused on a Mediterranean dietary pattern. Although both guidelines really talk about or um, acknowledge that a healthy balanced uh, cardiovascular diet is going to be a hallmark of hypertension control. Also important to note that although we everyone wants to pay their patients to stop smoking, um, there's not a lot of office data, office blood pressure data to support smoking cessation to lower blood pressure, but there is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring data um, to do that. Now, I said we were gonna talk about salt and sodium, and I think that's really important, okay? I took this picture actually at a hypertension meeting in San Francisco, and it's important to realize that you know, there's all kinds of different salts out there. Um, and if you have sodium in your, in your salt, which the vast majority do, it's going to raise blood pressure. The average worldwide intake of sodium per day in milligrams is 3,500 to 5,500. American Heart Association and European Society of Cardiology have different thresholds, which they um, recommend, okay, in terms of maximum sodium intake. And you can see those up here, okay? 
Okay. Now, how do we tell patients? Because every patient thinks, oh, I don't have much salt. I don't add salt. Well, it's important for them to realize that more almost, you know, greater than 90% of our sodium intake is in processed foods or inherent in the foods that we eat. Okay. Most people aren't adding significant amounts of sodium um, from the salt shaker. And that's really something that needs to be stressed to patients because everyone thinks they, they don't add a lot of sodium um, from the salt shaker, but definitely um, probably in the foods that they eat. Okay. The first study to really show that sodium, sodium intake increases blood pressure was the inner salt study. Um, and they used a surrogate for sodium intake, which was urinary sodium excretion. Um, and based, adjusted for a variety of factors, what they showed was if your sodium intake increases, so does your blood pressure. Okay. The other thing that you have to remember is that our response and blood pressure response to sodium changes as we get older, okay? Um, and as different medical conditions arise, we become more salt sensitive. So that changes the dose response curve. And that same amount of sodium that we may have had when we were 50 years old may not have impacted our blood pressure, but at 70 can raise blood pressure more significantly. And salt sensitivity is clearly present in patients with resistant hypertension, CKD, African-Americans, the elderly, among other factors. So what do we tell patients? Well, one level teaspoon of table salt should be their maximum for on a daily basis. That's equivalent to 2,300 milligrams of sodium or 100 millimoles of sodium. We have to limit it to that. And that's what the resistant hypertension guidelines um, suggest um, and most blood pressure expert, experts suggest. And that's an easy way to get it across to patients about how much sodium they should be having. Now, once we uh, proceed past sodium, which is really straightforward to talk about with patients, um, then we can talk about healthy dietary patterns for blood pressure reduction. Um, the most commonly talked about, at least uh, on this side of the Atlantic, um, is the DASH diet, okay? Um, it's important to remember that the DASH diet, which was published in the mid-90s in the New England Journal of Medicine, the original DASH diet was not a low-sodium diet, okay? Patients undertook about 3,200 milligrams of sodium daily. Okay, so technically not a low sodium diet. But we saw significant drops in blood pressure um, based on the, uh, the components of that. Okay, and that's not just office blood pressure, that's 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. Similarly, the Mediterranean diet does show blood pressure reductions. And you know, a good data from that is a sub study of the PREDIMED using 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And then similarly, a vegetarian diet can also lower office blood pressure, although the, the Clinical trial data is not as rigorous as the DASH or Mediterranean diet. There can be benefits, and so it's important to talk to our patients about that. What about uh, sleep disorders? Well, we all think about treating sleep apnea and think, oh, this will cure your blood pressure. Not necessarily, okay? The average individual that gets treated for obstructive sleep apnea only decreases their blood pressure about three over two millimeters of mercury. Okay, so you're not going to move someone from 160 systolic to 130 systolic just by treating their sleep apnea, or at least it's very uncommon that that would happen, okay? But we have to think beyond obstructive sleep apnea as well when we're talking about sleep quality and blood pressure, okay? I always like to show this uh, clinical case that was now about seven years old. Um, this individual, and they charted their blood pressures on the left, they slept poorly um, the night of the, uh, of the 12th of September of 2014. Um, and what do we see? Well, we see the subsequent days, heart rates more elevated, blood pressures more elevated. Increasing data suggests that poor sleep quality leads to paroxysmal hypertension and elevated blood pressure. And that's likely due to activation of the sympathetic nervous system and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay, um, this is almost can present as a pheochromocytoma picture or a pseudo pseudophiochromocytoma picture. And that's described nicely um, in the American Heart Association's 2018 uh, scientific uh, statement on resistant hypertension. So it's something to talk to your patients about and not just screen them for OSA, but make sure they're getting six to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep a night. So with all that said, um, I, I'm talking about you need to talk to lifestyle about your patients, but that takes time, okay? There was a nice piece in Jack um, about a year and a half ago looking at uh, comparing the European and American guidelines and saying, if we wanted to fully implement these, how long would it take in a clinical visit? 
Well, the lifestyle review and discussion would take almost 10 minutes, okay? Um, and you'd need a total of at least 23 minutes to get through measuring blood pressure properly, et cetera, okay? Um, in a busy clinic where you're turning patients over every 15 minutes, that can sometimes not necessarily be doable. So focusing on one of these uh, components, presumably low sodium intake, which can be done in a couple minutes, can be helpful. Then the other thing you have to remember is that medicine is a team sport. Okay, so really enlist dietitians, enlist nurses, enlist exercise physiologists, and you're going to get better outcomes, um, especially when we're talking about lifestyle treatment of hypertension. So the takeaway points for me from my lecture here today are lifestyle interventions for hypertension treatment are effective, okay, clearly effective. Low sodium diet is crucial um, and easy to talk to patients about if you know what you're going to tell them. And we really need to include a multidisciplinary team for the best patient results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our final speaker today. It's going to be Dr. Marwan Noel Sabal, who is the director of the Cleveland Clinic Lou. Ruvo Center for Brain Health uh, at Las Vegas, Nevada. He will talk to us about the relationship of statins and cognition. Uh, Dr. Sabag is a board certified neurologist and geriatric neurologist. And he is currently the Luvo Endowed Chair of Brain Health at the director of the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas. Uh, Dr. Sabag is a leading investigator in Alzheimer's disease, and he is on the editorial board of the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and BMC Neurology. Uh, Dr. Sabal earned his undergraduate degree from the University of California, Berkeley, his medical degree from Arizona, Tucson, and then he did his neurology at Bayer College in Houston, Texas. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Sabal. I'm looking forward to your talk. Hello, I'm Dr. Marwan Sabah. I am a neurologist and the director of the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health. Today, I'm going to talk about the cognitive impact of statin therapy. We start our conversation with the fact that if you Google search statins and memory, you hear the thing, I took a statin and my memory got worse. And that's a common complaint that people have. But this is a study that was published in Journal of Internal Medicine suggests people looked at health records to uh, uh, from millions of people and 483,000 people were prescribed a statin to lower their cholesterol. Uh, and the people who took a statin clearly had more complaints of memory loss compared to people who took non-statin drugs, suggesting that the uh, internet is uh, validated in a self-reporting questionnaire type uh, uh, study um, captured by primary care physicians. However, the objective data seems to be quite different. If you actually look at cholesterol and lipoproteins, the direct effects of plasma cholesterol and related lipoproteins on the incidence and severity of dementia and cognitive decline remains as a controversial topic deserving of deeper uh, exploration. Increasing evidence links brain cholesterol with plaques and tangles. In fact, there's some studies of animal data suggesting that uh, uh, animals fed uh, high saturated fat diets and high cholesterol diets had acceleration of amyloid and tangles, plaques and tangles in their brains. This is transgenic mice. Uh, so uh, there is animal evidence that that is the case. When we look at cholesterol and cognition, a positive correlation has been shown between HDL levels and MMSE performance. Uh, for this cardiology audience, MMSE is the mini mental state exam, and a negative correlation between LDL levels and immediate and delayed recall. Subjects with incident dementia have demonstrated higher total cholesterols at their first visit, and cholesterol levels and atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis have been found to be associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. There have been trials. So the reason you, this is very important for this audience to understand is that actually, you know, the anecdotal evidence of the internet is uh, juxtaposed against the fact that there is very robust evidence that a cholesterol lowering might be a good idea. It's so good 
there were actually three clinical trials performed uh, in the last 10 to 15 years. The first one was the one of the studies I did, uh, the SPARC study. In fact, I was the co-pre-I of that study. And that showed that uh, people who uh, took high doses of atorvastatin, that's 80 milligrams, uh, over six months had, uh, six and 12 months had lower rates of cognitive decline compared to those who did not take a statin. And so that was very robust. But the two other larger studies, the CLASP study and the LEAD study, uh, showed that uh, simvastatin was looked at and showed no uh, significant difference in the rate of cognitive decline between simvastatin and placebo. And in atorvastatin, again, high dose, 80 milligrams, there was no net benefit resulting from statin therapy compared to, to uh, uh, placebo over 72 weeks. I do want to comment, though, the p-value of that study was p of 0 0.09. They almost had statistical significance, uh, but the sample size, had the sample size just been 100 subjects more, you would be taking a, a torvastatin right now to treat uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. The reason this is also important is that uh, atorvastatin uh, has been shown to be uh, very safe, of course, but it, it seems to have had a selective benefit on people who came into the study with high uh, uh, lipids to begin with and it may have had a prevalence for people who are APOE4 carriers having an effect. So what I'm saying is that the primary, uh, primary evidence is that they have no clinical benefit. The reason Pfizer did not end up re repeating the study is it was too near the end of their patent life. So uh, the most, the first impression is that statin treatment for Alzheimer's disease dementia is negative, is negative and not advised. But if you look at the incidence of dementia, evidence suggests that statins decrease the incident risk of dementia and is very convincing from an epidemiological standpoint. Some studies show that statin users have a five-fold lower incidence of Alzheimer's disease and a three-fold lower incidence risk of uh, mild cognitive impairment. Therefore, these are, these are huge epidemiological studies that are performed on tens, hundreds of thousands of people and follow these people to see if they develop incident dementia or incident mild cognitive impairment. And then clearly the statin users had much, much lower rate of a decline or risk of progression. We have published, I have published on this particular topic a lot, the effect of statins on the rate of cognitive decline in mild cognitive impairment. This was a paper my team and I did uh, looking at the large neuro data set called AD, uh, Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. The hypothesis is that despite the lay perception of the untoward effects of statins, statins may have a positive effect on cognition. And the objective of the study was to assess whether or not cognitive declines is affected by statin regimen in a prospectively evaluated cohort. Data was used from the ADNI study. There were 1,737. 939 uh, were identified as cross-referencing. Some were split into uh, statins uh, versus non-statin users. And they were then substratified by APOE4 status. Uh, this is a very important study because it shows, if you look at the bar, uh, the bars, that the statin users had year over year. So what they did is they took a baseline cognitive stat measures. We broke it into statins versus non-statin users. And then we looked at the year one uh, cognitive decline or cognitive change after a year and showed that the people who took statins had less decline after a year compared to those who did not take the statin. And this was actually uh, not exclusively der derived by the APOE force carrier status. In fact, if anything, it was, uh, it was almost as good in the non-E4 carriers as it was in the E4 carriers. The conclusion is, is that there was less decline in statin users in mild cognitive impairment. It did not have a negative effect. So in other words, it did not, it actually had no adverse effects on cognition. And that uh, there is some evidence that the statin positivity is conf confounded by the presence of APOE4, suggesting that APOE4 people get more effect. Uh, and uh, it does suggest potentially a, a, a potential benefit. My team went on to go ahead and look at the next thing, which was neuropathology. And what we showed is that we looked at a large, large data set called NAC, National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center. This is uh, tens of thousands of brains that are brought to autopsy, and we stratify them by uh, people who t had a, all people in the study had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, both clinically and autopsy confirmed. And what we showed is that their uh, 
uh, uh, we want to look at whether they had more pathology, less pathology on the basis of their statin presence. My hypothesis for this particular study was that if you took statins chronically, you should have less amyloid or plaques and tangle pathology at death if you took a statin compared to the, uh, not taking a statin. The answer was no, that is not the case. Our conclusions are that the link between cholesterol and cognition and AD risk is significant. And for, second, uh, statins do not adversely affect cognition when measured objectively. Third is that statins might be protective. And fourth, this clinical trial evidence suggests that statins are not robust treatments for Alzheimer's disease dementia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Marwan, and um, we're going to try to get him on, and uh, Dr. Laffin, and Dr. Wyatt. So, uh, Dr. Laffin, I have, I have a question to kind of start off uh, our discussion here. Um, how long do you give patients a chance for lifestyle modifications? And, you know, I think this is a, and when do we expect to see results? So it generally depends on their risk, overall risk and how high their blood pressure is. So if we're between 130 and 140 in the office, um, then guidelines would suggest about three months of directed lifestyle therapy, particularly if they're not on medications. If they're higher than that, so you know 140 and above, uh, 140 and above, or at least 150 based on the U.S. or uh, the European guidelines, then you need to do both hand in hand. They got to walk out the door with a prescription for medicines plus lifestyle modification. Um, and typically we can see low sodium diet within about a week or so. We definitely see um, that benefit. Obviously the exercise weight loss component of that, that takes a little bit more time. Um, and then if you add in things like, you know, just decreasing alcohol intake, you know, a couple of weeks, we could generally see the benefit. Yeah, I find uh, sometimes uh, it actually encourages the patients when you tell them, look, we're gonna start a medication. If you make the lifestyle changes and you actually improve, then we can discuss, you know, dialing back on some of the, the, the medications or the dosing themselves. And that actually gives them an encouragement from a lifestyle standpoint. And the way that I phrase it with them is I say, low blood pressure, or excuse me, low sodium diet is worth, for example, one and a half to two medicines. I'm not wed to any of these prescriptions. If, you, if you're doing that and you call me back and say my blood pressure is in the 110s, we're going to take away a medicine or at least cut the dose. Um, yeah, so give them that carrot. I agree. And Dr. Marwan, very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Where Thank is you. all this uh, negative data on the internet about memory and statins coming from? That's a good question. I don't have a good answer for it, uh, but it's a very popular belief uh, and it just kind of self-perpetuating, but I have no clear uh, identification of the source of it. And if, if a patient comes to you and says, you know, and, and we see this regularly in clinic, uh, that I feel that my memory is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having problems remembering my keys, et cetera, whilst being on the statin, what, what do you say to them? What I would do is, uh, uh, I would first of all say that the data doesn't support that, but my impression would be is that we understand that cardiovascular disease hypertension, hyperlipidemia, all are risk factors for developing cognitive impairment uh, over time. I would do some kind of objective measuring before and after and say, you know, the evidence is that this is not related to statins. You may have other reasons to be having a memory issue, but not it's not an exclusive statin issue. And uh, Dr. Lappin, I have a question uh, for you. Um, you. You mentioned sleep hygiene. and. and as a very important uh, uh, part of blood pressure control. You know, I find that sometimes it's a tough thing because a, a lot of patients have uh, difficulty with you know, sleep and how do you approach that? I mean, what, what do you tell, you know, it's easy for us to say get good sleep and a lot of us just don't or can't. Right, right. So um, things that you can do specifically from the physician perspective, you know, make sure certain drugs are not being taken at night, like diuretics. You'd be surprised the number of patients that take their diuretic around dinner time or so. Um, so that's one simple thing that you can do. You know, when I talk more globally with them, I tell them you need six to eight hours of as interrupt, uninterrupted sleep as possible. So it includes going to sleep at the same time every night 
and it's not that doesn't mean sitting in bed for two hours from 10 o'clock till midnight um, so go to bed when you're tired wake up at the same time whether it's on a weekday or a weekend um, and when you wake up just get out of bed there's no point tossing and turning for two hours um, and then also telling them that if you if you're eating right if you're exercising doing that that makes sleeping easier as well um, and then simple things like cool dark room you know uh, blackout shades all of that um, are real straightforward things that they can do and then if it gets to the point where they need a sleep hygiene or excuse me a sleep medicine like a little bit of zolpidem or something like that I don't hesitate to do that for a short course as well to get them on better track. Great. So um, I think we, we should, um, we can wrap up here and we just want to thank all the speakers, Dr. Marwan, Dr. Laffin and everyone else and all the panelists uh, uh, for a, a wonderful talk and discussion today. And um, we want to thank the audience for, for joining us today. And, um, and of course, we'll move forward and plan for the next webinar and hope to see everyone there next week. Uh, We'll plan for an electrophysiology webinar and followed by valvular heart disease, vascular disease, and heart failure management strategies. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you for including me. Thank you. Thank you.